I would like to read a few lines from Schmidt and Cohen's book, The New Digital Age, to get your reaction. They write, quote, authoritarian regimes will put up a vicious fight. They will leverage the permanence of information and their control over mobile and internet service providers to create an environment of heightened vulnerability for their citizens. Where little privacy existed before will be long gone because the handsets that citizens have with them at all times will double as the surveillance bugs regimes have long wished they could put in people's homes, unquote. How is it possible, Julian, that they could describe a vision of future authoritarianism, but be oblivious or not realize that people would see it, that they're actually describing their own role in the world today? I know. It's, it's that blinkered American exceptionalism that simply can't... It's an extraordinary thing that simply has no ability to self-reflect. That What they are describing, of course, uh, is the most expansive, aggressive surveillance state that we have, which is the Five Eyes Alliance, uh, the National Security Agency in the United States, the big the elephant in the room, and then the smaller players, uh, GCHQ and similar institutions in Australia, New Zealand and Canada. Um, uh, and Google's role in powering handsets, 80% of the smartphones now sold, uh, run by Google, even if it's another brand on the phone, the insides are run by Google. Every search goes back, back to Google. Uh, the contacts go back, are stored in Google. The emails uh, go back to Google. The location, location information of where each person is goes to Google. The names of the wireless networks that are around them are collected by the phones and go back to Google. Uh, so it's a, a remarkable thing. But they, they try and excuse this phenomenon by saying, as I said before, that uh, if a Western government does it, it's okay because they're just going to measure more about their population and therefore have more information to respond to its needs. Uh, now, that's an interesting... That could be true. I mean, in theory, there could be a situation where that could be true, that a government collecting lots of information, if it was a highly responsive democratic government uh, whose abuses were all uncovered immediately, uh, maybe that would actually be a true situation. But um, we know, as a matter of empirical practice, um, that the United States government doesn't operate like that. We know it because every Tuesday it has an extrajudicial assassination meeting uh, in the White House with Barack Obama signing off who is to live and who is to die without any uh, court process. We know as a result of the extensive unlawful activity, uh, breaking a law conducted by the National Security National Security Agency, and of course the various abuses by the justice system, uh, as even seen um, in the case of, of WikiLeaks and the US government trying to crack down on publishers. So we know that um, we don't have that uh, responsive government that would simply innocently look over all this information that has been collected uh, and use it to respond uh, in a humane way uh, to its citizenry. At this point, I'd like to ask you about this curious cable behind you, Julian. What is the significance of this document? Well, this cable behind me, <coughs> um, which you can find by uh, searching the net, Googling even, uh, for WikiLeaks NATO head. Uh, this cable is um, how the current NATO head, Remusen, got his job. Now, you might think, well, why, why is that interesting? Well, this cable has everything. Um, it has the Kurds. It has the destruction of an entire TV station. Uh, uh, corrupt deals between intelligence agencies and the judiciary. Uh, the corruption of a Scandinavian country, Denmark. Uh, and the head of that country, um, the prime minister, doing a corrupt deal to get his job. Uh, and the whole thing signed off by, explicitly, by Barack Obama, the whole deal. And so, uh, to make a, a long and very interesting story short, um, uh, Turkey has a veto on who would become the next, has a veto on who becomes the next head of NATO. Uh, and when the current head was going to be the next head of NATO, uh, he was the Danish Prime Minister. And operating out of Denmark is the largest Kurdish TV station, Kurdish language TV station. 
And of course, it can't operate out of Turkey because of the Turkish crackdown on the Kurds. So they operate out of Denmark, beam their satellite signal up. It gets broadcast down by Eurosat and people in Kurdistan and in Turkey are able to watch it. Very important uh, to have a national language broadcaster. Um, but that had infuriated the Kurds over many years. And so they had been making constant complaints to Denmark saying, oh, they're too critical, they're too biased, we think they're promoting terrorism, etc." So the Danish, in response, formally investigated it twice and found, no, it was doing just the same as all other new news stations. They couldn't find any connection with the PKK and it wasn't promoting violence. Uh, but, so what to do now? Um, well, uh, the then Danish Prime Minister, uh, as a part of a deal with Obama and Turkey, that he would have the NATO leadership, uh, got the... Um, the Danish, uh, judiciary, Danish prosecuting authority and the Danish intelligence uh, to work out how to crush this TV station and take it down. And they're going to try all different methods and use creative tax investigations, even uses that word creative uh, in the cable, uh, to work out how to smash it. Uh, and eventually, Ramusen was given the job, the TV station was destroyed, uh, and this year, that whole case taken by the TV station against that activity is before the European courts, for European Court of Human Rights, uh, and this cable is the star exhibit in that case. You describe Google as a don't be evil empire, but you write that it's still an empire. This term is traditionally applied to nations and states. How is Google an empire? Well, that phrase, evil empire, was introduced by Reagan in the 1980s to describe the Soviet empire. Uh, but of course, encoded within that is that the other empire is not an evil empire. That the US empire is a don't be evil empire. And that, that phrase of uh, don't be evil uh, was adopted by Google and promoted by Google um, in terms of its how it was going to do things. Um, and it was used quite effectively to lull people into a false sense uh, that Google was a different type of company. Uh, combined with its basic business model of creating a free services trap. So if your email is free, just give it all to us. Uh, this web search is free, just tell us all the things that you're searching for. Um, permitted a perception uh, that Google was not like a normal for-profit company, that it was not a great big um, US institution that has all this, the same problems as uh, companies like Coca-Cola or, or Lockheed Martin or Rayathon. Uh, and in fact, in the very beginning of Google, perhaps that was true when it was a small startup in California. But as it got very large, uh, like many companies, it also entered into relationship with the state. It needed that relationship in order to pursue its foreign markets and so on. Uh, and it now has involvements in every single country in the world, uh, perhaps other than North Korea. And um, the result of that, it you know, it's the second largest company in the United States. Uh, it deals with billions of people every day, collecting information of billions of people every day. Uh, Google is uh, an empire. And there's a question about what are the relationships of that empire? Who's it, who's it allied to? What, it's, what is its ideological position? What is its basic business model? Its basic business model is the same as the National Security Agency. Collect the world's information, store it, index it. Uh, and work out how to predict people based on that. That's its basic business model. It can't change from that. Um, its basic political alignments uh, are reflected by the business deals it has with the US government. Its definition as being part of the, formerly part of the US defense industrial base uh, and the ideological uh, views of its executive leadership, which are documented in the book, which can simply be described as, as you know, um, uh, American uh, centrist, um, aggressive American exceptionalism. The Union of South American Nations, UNISUR, has proposed a digital ring to electronically consolidate 12 Latin American countries and including the BRICS countries of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. What do you think of this project as a counter to the Google Empire? In the last 200 years, we have seen three great games. The first great game was for control of Central Asia and 
principally uh, Russia and um, the United Kingdom battled out uh, for domination of these Central Asian states. Uh, the second great game, uh, which has occurred in this century, has been the great game for the control of oil pipelines, where they transit through, where the oil is coming from, and so on. And we can see that uh, playing out right now uh, in terms of uh, Ukraine, uh, for example, or uh, uh, Libya, versus, uh, Libya versus Syria versus Qatar, and the oil pipelines uh, coming up and down to Russia there. And the third great game is the great game for control over the telecommunications between one continent and another, or one great population region and another. Uh, because if you can turn that off, you can destroy a whole economy. It all, its ability to access information, to communicate with the rest of the world, to plan trades, to conduct electronic fund, uh, funds transfers, uh, and various other forms of payments is all destroyed. Or, if you're able to intercept it all, uh, then you can understand and uh, uh, work out uh, how to outmaneuver um, uh, entire groups of nations or economic developments within those nations. And that is sort of reflected, for example, by the National Security Agency spying on the Brazilian company, oil company Petrobras, uh, and a number of other companies, the Swedes spying on Gazprom, etc. Um, so uh, it's very important that UNESOR have a fiber optic cable ring uh, that connects the uh, Southern American uh, countries together. Uh, so it can't be cut off if there's a, a significant conflict in the United States because presently 98% of South American communications flow through the United States on the, to the rest of the world. They're intercepted there by the National Security Agency, but also if push comes to shove, the US can simply disconnect Latin America from the rest of the world. And that's a very serious leverage the United States has over Latin America. So it should at least be able to have intercommunication uh, with, it, with itself to try and resist that. Uh, and that will also help to some degree uh, with the interception problems. In your conversation with Schmidt and Cohen, you discuss the architecture of WikiLeaks technological platform and also the digital currency Bitcoin. Through this, readers are able to get an outline of your vision for the internet. Tell me more about your vision. Something very significant has happened with Bitcoin. It is the most intellectually interesting innovation that I have seen uh, in the past five years on the internet. And it's not for the reason that most people think, uh, that it's an international uh, currency that can't easily be blocked by states. That is very important. But the building blocks of that can lead to a great many different uh, uh, new innovations. Uh, and so the essential building block uh, is proof of publishing at a particular time, in a particular place, in a way that cannot be altered. Um, and the way this is used in Bitcoin uh, is every transaction in Bitcoin is um, recorded uh, and that is, is published. So if I give you a transaction, that's recorded. Uh, and it means that I can't give that same coin to someone else because everyone can look up in this global ledger of all the transactions and see that you have this coin now, not me anymore. And therefore, I can't spend it twice. Uh, and therefore, people can be confident that they're not going to be ripped off uh, in the process of this transaction. But what that means is that there has to be a global consensus uh, uh, global uh, consensus, unalterable, uh, about what actually happened. And that global consensus mechanism, uh, locked down as a result of this, there being so many computers in so many different jurisdictions, means that history can be protected. So Orwell's dictum, if you remember, going back to 1984, is he who controls the present controls the past, he who controls the past controls the future. It's, it's actually very deep, so let's just unpack it a bit. If you control the present, you can control all the libraries, the internet servers, uh, and so on. Uh, and any piece of history that is stored is stored somewhere in the present, uh, and you can go in and change it. So you can change who has what money, uh, who, 
who, who owns what land, because there's land re registers and so on, or what happened in a war. All these things you can change if you control the present. Uh, and that is done uh, in different ways. Um, and if you control the present, you can control everyone's perception about the present. And with that, you can control the future. Um, so Bitcoin has a, a mechanism that it evolved, uh, it will, that it innovated to deal with this problem of double spending. Uh, but the same mechanism um, can be used for international agreements of lots of people. It can be used for digital voting, a completely accurate record of who voted for what, for when, that cannot be altered. Um, it can also be used for, for regular publishers uh, to um, prove that they publish something at a certain time uh, and that they haven't deleted it or modified it uh, subsequently. And that can create a scaffold of history of all, you know, everything that appears in the newspaper, what appears on TeleSurf, uh, that can be locked down in such a way that new powerful figures can't come back and change uh, that information. And that then removes the incentive for censorship. Because if you can't get away with censorship, uh, a lot of the incentive uh, to actually do it uh, is removed. And that's very, a very powerful thing. 